Welcome to Beyond the Frontline Podcast, where your hosts, U.S. Air Force veterans, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson, will help you transition from the front line to the home front. Listen every other Wednesday as they will bring great conversations, resources, tips, and feel-good stories that will resonate and relate. Now, here's your hosts, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson. Hey everyone, it's Donna and I am flying solo today. Jay is off traipsing the country doing his motivational speaking and he's very good at it. If you ever see Jay Johnson out and about, you should go check it out. He always has a good message. But today we're going to actually bring on a very special guest. His name is Saul Paul, and there is a story behind his name. So if y'all just hold on a moment, I'm going to go get him out of the waiting room. Well, hello there, Mr. Saul. Hello, hello, friend. How are you? Good. How are you? All right. Are you in San Antonio right now? I am. So the weather is, I was there, my wife was there this weekend. Dreary. So is it dreary? Are you in Austin? Is it dreary up there? Yeah. Super dreary. Yeah. We're not used to, I mean, like, we like rain. I like rain. But, like, when it goes past, like, three, four days, I think all I of Texas you, gets depressed. The calendar, it's, like, literally been three, four days already, right? Yeah. And it's, like, there's, like... Till Thanksgiving, it's like till next Tuesday, Wednesday, this is the weather. Like I know. I think we get depressed when we get that much dreary weather. We're so used to sun like 350 days a year. I know. Uh, I don't know how they do it on the West Coast. But or in uh, uh, on the West Coast? Or the, oh, up in, yeah, up in Seattle. Yeah. And so, well, that was like when I lived in England, honestly. And it was that dreary, misty, you felt wet all the time all the time. They hated that feeling. But when they had a summer day, it was the most pristine summer day you've ever had. It was amazing. So let's start with the intro since I kind of did a little, I usually do a little back talk and what's going on in our world. And I always say mine's in blissful chaos most of the time. Uh, it's all good, but it's just going at lightning speed. So I'm just always trying to hold on and enjoy every single moment. So, and so I know that you're you're a lot like that too. And and your story is going to lend to that statement once we hear it. So, all right, let me back up here. So how long ago was it, Saul, that we met? A month ago or so? I think it was. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Mega Vet Sweat Gala. Right, at the gala. We met there. So you were, you were the entertainment there. And I was lucky well, enough to be one of the... Actually, actually, well, a couple things as we get it straight. Okay, go ahead, one, correct. Um, I have a skit on my album, one of my first albums, and it says, my name is not Sean Paul, I'm not Jamaican. It's not South Park. I'm not a cartoon. It's not South Paul. I'm not a cartoon. I'm not left-handed. Not lefty. Not Sao Paulo, not a country. It's just Saul Paul. Wow. Because people inadvertently call me Saul all the time, which that was the, the least preferable, uh, SP for short, or Saul Paul, if we're being proper. All right, Saul Paul. What, what do you prefer, SP or Saul Paul? I'm I'm akin to Saul either. Paul, yeah. I'm indifferent, but yeah, Saul Paul. So there's definitely a significance, and we can probably talk about where that name came from. So I guess my preference is Saul Paul. And then also, I'm big on, uh, yeah, when I was at the Mega, Mega Vet Sweat Gala, I was not there as an entertainment. I was actually there as a keynote. You so, were a keynote, but you were, that, that's what I was starting to say. It was like, I'm very entertaining. I'm very entertaining. You are, so yeah. <laughs> you are very entertaining. Well, entertainment, that was the rest of it was like, but he wasn't just the entertainer. He was the keynote speaker and he really was the MC too. He was really doing it all and kind of keeping very, the whole evening going and did a fabulous job at it. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I just got invited to be the MC of the, 2024 South by Southwest Innovation Awards. Oh, so, how yeah. neat. Yeah, that's a that's going to be my Oscars. It's that's going to be your... I'm going to well... treat it as such. Yeah. <laughs> well, let... everybody's like, what are we talking about? So this is what we're talking yeah. about. Saul Paul and I 
met at a Make a Vet Sweat gala. If you do not know what Make a Vet Sweat is, look it up, makeavetsweat.org. Uh, awesome nonprofit that helps uh, veterans that are struggling with things like PTSD and invisible wounds um, get free gym memberships for a specified period of time. Um, and so he was keynote speaker slash entertainer slash MC at the event and was just really impressive. And when he got done, I just walked over and said, hey, my name's Donna. This is what we do. And you really impressed me. And I want to talk. And I'd love to have you on the podcast. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And so um, little did I know at that time, he was just getting ready to launch his new record. Um, and I had to wait a little bit, but I have him now. So officially, this is Saul Paul, who is a musician with a message. He is a one-time Grammy-nominated producer, a two-time Grammy-nominated artist. He has done three TEDx talks. And he uses music to empower people to live their best life. And I will say, after you get done um, watching him in action, if you are not empowered to do better, then you weren't listening. Because it was very empowering. It was very uplifting. It was very impressive. So, officially, welcome, Saul Paul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Excited to be here, Miss Donna. Mm-hmm. So, let I'm going to you've said this story a lot of times. I'm sure people can go look this up, but this is kind of why we're bringing you on the beyond the front line. I want to be clear is that Saul Paul is not a military member, he um, does not have a prior military history. However, the reason why I wanted him to come talk to us was to talk about his message of resiliency, and that is a strong message that he has. So to start, I want to hear your story from the beginning, where you started and where you're at. Because let me tell you, folks, when you hear the beginning, you're going to be shocked at where he is now and how he got there. So Saul Paul, I'll let that be right, on you. Try. Awesome. I'm going to try something new. So instead of going on a 40, I could, you know, I could talk for 45 minutes straight. So I'm going to try to chop it up and let you interject and, and, and lead me along. But I'll start at the beginning. Um, I'm a blessed individual. Um, my mom died when I was three. My dad left before I was born. Uh, through no fault of my own, I was placed in the foster care. Um, I was adopted by this amazing woman named Pearlie. Everybody called her Big Mama. I just called her Mama. She was the only mother that I knew. Uh, she had already raised 16 children of her own prior to raising me. When she raised me, she raised me as an only child. So it was just me and her. Uh, a side note, I wrote a song about her uh, and that how amazing she was. It's called Mama. I dedicated to all the mamas, 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 and mamas, 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 <laughs> all the make they are. So uh, anyone listening to this should definitely go listen to that song. You can find it wherever music is. But she definitely... Uh, is the reason why I launched this movement called Be The Change, because she chose to be the change in my life. She didn't have to, but she did. She raised me as her own. Um, nonetheless, even though uh, my house was full of love, we didn't have much more. I grew up in a little wood house, no carpet, no AC. Uh, um, the wood house was sitting on bricks. I grew up in Houston, Texas. Uh, she raised me on food stamps and food from the church food pantry. Um, she did the best she could. Nonetheless, I still had free will. Uh, and I chose to make uh, risky choices. Uh, my environment played a part in the choices that I made. Like a man was murdered in my front yard. Damn. The person that murdered, yeah, the man that murdered the man was a relative. Uh, I grew up next door to a dope house. Now they call it a trap house. Uh, the person that owned that house was a relative. So this is just me explaining like the environment I grew up in. Uh, every male in my family before me uh, had been incarcerated. So generations and generations of incarceration. 
Shout out to uh, the veterans as well, though. I had some individuals in my family that were vets. Uh, but what I saw growing up was crime, um, violence, um, and, and, and everything else. And the crazy part about it is that that's what's, that is what was exciting to me. Uh, I was living in two worlds. Uh, I had this natural gift, like scholastic aptitude. Basically, I did well in school without trying. It was just a gift. So when I would go to school, I would be around, uh, you know, those that did academically well. And when I was at home in my hood, I was around those that broke the law and did that extremely well. And it was, I was just living in these two worlds. Uh, by the time I was 17, I got arrested by the FBI. A- FBI? Like you skipped the police and you just, first arrest was the yeah, FBI? That part. Yeah, like there's levels to everything. Um you know, and when I put it in context, which I didn't, my career is, uh, I brand myself as a musician with the message, but basically uh, I am a musician and a success coach. My focus is the science of success, because as you mentioned earlier, we talk, when we get to the end and like how my story played out, I've become very successful uh, and not just once or twice, but like on demand, I've been able to create success in my life. But I think it's just because I survived and made so many mistakes on the front end. And actually, it's because I studied it. But growing up, so one thing I always talk about is, like, there's levels to everything. In my hood, uh, you know, you could get in, right? you could get in trouble. Like, the resource officer, that's the school police officer. The city, right? Like, you might have the city cop uh, or, like, uh, like, uh, like, like uh, the sheriff, right? That's county. Uh, I skipped all that, went straight to FBI. And the crazy part is just like getting an athletic scholarship, you might go to JUCO or you can go to a D2 uh, or you can go to a D1 school. Uh, I went to a D1, uh, but it was the FBI. A D1 school or a D1 detention you know, center? <laughs> you, you make a great point. That's a great question. Uh, I was being creative when I said D1. <laughs> I was making a parallel, just like college, like there are levels to it. And ah. so like you said, I went big. So, and that'll be a constant thing through life. Uh, and yeah. What were you arrested? This, what were you arrested for that first time? Making dumb decisions. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to put this in context, because yeah, people don't have context. So let me give context. So yeah. My day job is as a musician and a keynote speaker and success coach. Uh, I share my story but not just for the sake of sharing my story, but I know that there are life lessons that people can learn in the process. Right. Even from my life, I was able to discover techniques and things about myself that I could use to be successful. So the reality is like in life, I always go big. So even when I, when I was doing the wrong thing, I went big. Now that I do the right thing, I go big <laughs> because it's my nature. And it's smart to understand who you are because then you don't have to spend time striving and trying to be, you just are what you are and you put yourself in the right position. So anyway, when I was uh, a teenager, yeah, I grew up in the hood. People in my neighborhood sold drugs. Uh, I asked myself, like, why do people sell drugs? Well, people sell drugs to make money. So me, I skipped selling drugs. I just went straight to making money, but that's a federal offense. And that's why I was arrested by the FBI. But you said, like, when you, so I'm con, I'm confused. You went, you said you skipped selling drugs. What did you skip to? To making money. Pro, make, but selling drugs is making money. <laughs> I lost. know, yeah. Like, you sell drugs to make money, but you could also just. Uh, were you like the distributor? Is that what we're kind of audience right now. So I think lots of people in the audience are getting around that. Oh, oh, oh. like, yeah, like. Uh, you know, like making money, making money is is not it's frowned upon by the government. Like they make money. You don't get to make money. They print money. You don't get to print money. Gotcha. You get it? Do you get it? Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was a federal offense to to make my own money. Gotcha. So in the literal sense, make your money. I'm slow, but I'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, talking. So yeah, one time a friend of mine, well, yeah, it was a friend of mine, but it was later in life, and he was like, after he finally got it, like, whoa, he's like, dude, you're like a 
criminal genius like you know, like Lex Luthor or something like. Uh, but that's why I just say really it was making dumb decisions. Like that's the takeaway that I like my young audience to get from it because they're always um, enamored by like, oh wow you got arrested by the FBI like for what and it's like that doesn't need to be glamorized. No. What I, what I did was make dumb decisions, and I would like to highlight that just because you're smart doesn't mean you can't make dumb decisions. And more importantly, just because yes. you make dumb decisions doesn't mean you're not smart. But that, you know what, that those go hand in hand, right? So when, so, you know, I was told um, a friend of mine has a daughter with an IQ of like 162. And when they tested her and did all this stuff, they said to her, the mom, don't even, it doesn't matter what her numbers are. She's highly, highly, highly intelligent. She doesn't need that information because she's also highly, highly, highly manipulative. That comes mm. with the intelligence. And you have to know how to channel that in the right way. So I kind of always joke saying the goal is to make him the CEO, not the gang leader. But there is truth in what you're saying. You're extremely intelligent. You you just used it in the wrong place. <laughs> exactly. That's why I do a lot of work. I have a foundation. It's called the Saul Paul Foundation. We um, empower young people to make, uh, we empower young people to live their best lives. And we empower community members to be community leaders by helping them. And it's because of what you just shared. It's like me recognizing they can either be the gang leader or the CEO, but sometimes direction is necessary. Yes. It's like how, do we, how do we point them in the right direction? Me, I didn't have any direction. I had a lot of love. My grandmother was amazing. Uh, I had a lot of negative influence, but there wasn't too much positive direction. Do you, uh, do you think that that's where um, some nature versus nurture comes in? Like you, you had that. It's interesting to hear you because you had that core love, right, from your mom. And, and you, thank goodness, she had yeah. that in you because then surrounding you, you had all kinds of bad decisions at your doorstep, literally, right? Yeah. And I, and do you wonder or do you think that you were able to eventually, because there's more to this story, eventually course correct because of what she's put seeded in you? in the early years? Yes, that's it exactly. Because of those seeds that were sown and uh, I had the opportunity because of those seeds that were sown and the fact that I was still alive, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to change. That's why I'm so against, um, you know, I'm, I'm all about mental health. I'm all about uh, loving on others, encouraging others and making sure making sure that everyone is well so that their lives do not end uh, so that they don't die by suicide. Because as long as you're living, you have an opportunity to win. But if you're not, then you don't. And that's key. We can tiptoe around a lot of stuff, but you know, if you're not alive, you don't have the chance to win. So me, I made so many bad choices, but I was still alive. And so like what ends up happening, if I was to skip ahead a little bit, um, at 17, I get arrested by the FBI. At the same time, my grandmother is sick. She's in the hospital. She never knew I got arrested. If she did, she would have died of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. But instead, she passed away first. Uh, now I'm on my own. Uh, I'm couch surfing. I'm staying with various relatives. Uh, I made a lot of bad choices when she was alive. After she passed away, it was like, you know, it just went off the rails. I made a, so many more bad choices. I had nothing to live for because the one person that loved me uh, and, and supported me is now gone. So at 17, I get arrested the first time. She passes away. It took only three years before I was convicted of three additional felonies, mm. making a total of four felonies. And by the time I was 20, I was sitting in the Texas State Penitentiary. Damn. You, you said you go big. You don't waste any time. And, and, and when you're spiraling... You, you kept it consistent, right? You kept going big, but just in a spiral. Exactly. Um, so at 20 years old, I'm sitting in the Texas State Penitentiary. I often like to pause and ask people, like, uh, you know, when I talk to young people, I'm like, who knows what you want to do on your 21st birthday? 
and everybody has a vision, a plan, a hope, a trip, or they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And then I asked a room full of adults, right? Like, who knows what you were doing on your 21st birthday? And then everybody has uh, an anecdote or a story or a memory. Yeah. Me, my 21st birthday in the Texas State Penitentiary. That's and memorable. Ate, yeah. I ate spread. Spread is what they call it when you take ramen noodles, you take a bunch of them, and you put them inside of a big plastic bag, and you cook them, and you crush some Cheetos and various other things that you get from commissary and prison, you put them all in the bag and you mix it up and then you spread it out on the table and you share it with your other inmates, your other cellies. Mm. My 21st birthday, it was not the vision that I had for my life at all. But as I'm sitting in prison, I'm realizing like um, life is the sum total of the choices you make. I came to realize that I wasn't in prison because my mom died or my dad left because I was black, because I grew up in the ghetto, because of poverty. It wasn't the system. It wasn't the man. This was very empowering. I realized I was in prison because of the choices I had been making. And but here was the twist. I realized that if I changed my choices, I could change my life. I did. And then I went from prison incarceration to college graduation from one of the most prestigious universities in the country, the prestigious University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> Did, so did your aha moment come while you were in prison? It did. My aha moment came as I was sitting alone in a prison cell. And to reference uh, earlier, those seeds that were sown, mm -hmm. that was finally when they got watered. Watered, yeah. My mother had loved on me and she had sown these seeds. And it wasn't just her. It was adults who had spoken to my life. I, there wasn't too many positive role models. Uh, but there were people along the way that spoke an encouraging word or told me this or told me that. And if they went off of what they saw, then it didn't work. They saw potential in me. They saw me going the wrong way. And the last they might have heard was like, yeah, he didn't listen. And he's in prison, convicted of four felonies with 10 years. But that's not how the story ended. Because I kept living, I had the opportunity to keep going and to get it right. So I'm sitting in prison. And so those seeds started to sprout. I started to have all these aha moments like, oh, that's what Coach Gabe meant. That's what Principal Johnson meant. This is what my counselor, Miss Ben, meant. This is what Mama meant. This is what Unc meant. Like those seeds were sown. So that was one. But then the real aha moment that brought it all together was uh, prison is two things. Um, prison is uh, it's scary. Not that I was scared, but it's it's a crazy environment. So yeah, it's like this is this this is a while. That's why I I as you mentioned earlier, I I'm I'm not uh, ex military. I've never been in the military, but I was in prison with some people who were, and I know some other vets as well. That's how I ended up at the event that I was with you at. And what I've learned is that because I like uh, what I've learned is that prison and the military have many things in common. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. Yeah. yeah. So I'm in prison. And uh, so just like if you're in the military, right, you can say it's scary. And it's like, yeah, but I'm not going to die. So then you move different and you do what you need to do and you become the aggressor instead of the prey or whatever it may be. So that's mm -hmm. what prison was. It's like, cool. So, yeah, this is wild. This is a scary situation. But I became the aggressor, not the prey. Cool. Got past that part. That wasn't that wasn't complicated. I grew up in the hood. I grew up in a violent, crazy environment. So sadly, this is heartbreaking. Maybe we should come back to this later. Being in prison sadly felt so much like being in my neighborhood, but that's a different conversation. No, but you, you bring up a really good point on that. And we don't have to get in the weedy details about it, but I was just sitting there thinking as you were saying that, I'm like, I bet you on some level that there was more security and oh, yeah. calmness in prison than there was where you were growing up, where you were a child and had no control over that. Well, I won't say that for me. But definitely, sadly, there are individuals that that is very true. Yeah. I have two older brothers, two siblings. Yeah. Uh, grew up estranged from. One of them was institutionalized to the point where when he got out of prison, he literally asked to be sent back to prison. Yeah, I, I bet. more in prison than he was the free world. Yeah. And his parole officer told him it doesn't work that way. She can't just send him back. So he intentionally broke the law and got caught just so he could go back. But that's yeah. that's the but, institution a lot. But that's a mental but you know what? It's gonna sound silly when I compare this. Getting out of the military now, not on the same level, 
but there is a struggle transitioning out of the military on the same premise. You know, we yes. we are told when we have to go to our medical appointments, our dental appointments, when we're deploying, where we're going to work, when we're going to be there. I mean, everything is laid out. We don't even have to pick our dang clothes, right? I mean, my exactly. my uh, biggest stressor in getting dressed was which underwear am I picking today? I mean, that there is a lot of control. So coming out of the military, I was like, oh, yeah, don't forget to schedule your dental appointment. Is it a lighter version? Of course it is. I would never, ever put it on the same yeah, level um, as prison. I think that's, that's, the, that's the point, though. Yeah, it's very mm-hmm. similar. That's what I've noticed from those that I went that path. I went this other. But for me, it, so you're very true. That's very true. But as you were saying, though, that's also where I had my aha moment. And the aha moment was, because, um, again, right, prison is two things. Prison is, uh, you know, it's this, this, this crazy situation, this scary situation. And it's also boring. Yeah. Because you get past the, yeah, I'm not going to die here. Uh, okay, cool. So now I'm here. And now what? what? Is there? Yeah, exactly. So now what? So I played a lot of chess. Uh, I learned how to play chess. I think the best chess players are in prison, if you ask me. I bet. And I learned to play chess. Uh, I read a lot of books. I read so many books. I read all the books in uh, my cell, in my tank. I read everything I could. And after I read all the books I could read, uh, I was still in prison and I was still bored. So I picked <laughs> up a Bible. And so me, I started reading the Bible like it was a novel and then it came to life. Uh, that's, that was the aha moment. I would say like the, these seeds were sown into my life, but they got watered and then the sun shined on them when I started reading the Bible, which I was raised in church, uh, but it was still foreign to me. Like I didn't, I, I knew a couple Bible stories from a vacation Bible school, but I had no relationship with God. Nonetheless, I'm in prison. All I had was some time on my hands, some solitude and a Bible. I started reading the Bible. That's when I had the aha moment. And I discovered I was born on purpose with a purpose. I started walking in my purpose. I took that same risk of verse. Uh, I was like, uh, I took that same behavior that allowed me to be bold and, and to take chances and to take risks. And I applied to something different. I applied it to faith. I started living my faith. Remember, I've always did it big. And now I started to dream big. And I was like, okay, I get it. If I'm born on purpose with a purpose and uh, God, you know, will is to, 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 to bless me and not harm me, to do me good, not bad, and to see me succeed. And I started to believe and I dreamed up dreams like, okay, you know what? I'm going to get out of prison and I'm going to go to college. And I did. I got out of prison. And then sometimes people will ask, like, was it good behavior? And sadly, no, it was not. Uh, the first year I went back, the first year I was in prison, uh, again, as I mentioned, it felt like a family reunion. I saw people that I hadn't seen since elementary, so middle school, you high got, school. You got out. So you got out and then you started to go to college and ended up back in prison or you? Oh, no, no. Uh, well, if I tell it in chronological order, what happens is, my grandmother passed away mm-hmm. uh, when I'm a junior in high school. Actually, the summer before my senior year, uh, she passes away. My senior year, I stayed with relatives, couch surfing and whatnot. Uh, I graduated and got an academic scholarship and went to college. I went oh. to the University of Texas. Okay. But this is why I have a foundation. This is why I spend so much time on uh, life skills. I made it to college off of natural talent. Right. I didn't have the skill set, the mindset, or the grind set. So it didn't work while I was there. Uh, I thought the same thing that got me into college would keep me, but it didn't. Like, I needed to study. I needed to do what I was supposed to do. And I didn't know this at this point. Uh, So I flunk out, lose my academic scholarship, resort to a life of crime, because now not staying on campus, not having an academic scholarship, I'm ultimately homeless. Mm-hmm. I don't have a family to return to, right? Like I don't have a mom, a dad, the grandmother that raised me, she's gone. So I had no home to return to. I had no source of income. So I resorted to a life of crime because sadly that's what was familiar. That's what I grew up knowing how to do. So I went back to that um, and then ultimately got convicted of three additional felonies. Okay. I had- so you so did? Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So now I'm in prison. Now in prison, I have my aha moment. I realized if I change my choices, I could change my life. I did. I get out of prison. 
now society and any and everybody that will uh, that I'll listen to is telling me my life is over. I blew it. People like to when like when I was in prison, I would we would watch UT football games. It's a big deal. Like it, like it's Texas. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, right. So it's like you watch football, and then it's UT football. And I remember being like, I was at UT. Like I knew these, I knew some of the football players. And I'm watching the games with the other uh, felons, the other inmates, uh, the other prisoners that are locked up and incarcerated like me. And we'd be watching the game, and you know, just be like casually mention like, "Oh yeah, I know him. I know him. Oh, I used to kick you with him." And like they were like in disbelief, like what, like. How? Like, how would you know them? And I was like, I went to college, like with them. I went, and they're like, what college? I'm like, UT. They're like, UT what? I'm like, UT Austin. And then they're like, they stopped looking. I, re- I remember it so clear. They were like, stop watching the game. And then they're looking directly at me in disbelief, right? Like, you went to UT. And you're here. So, like, UT, like, they're, they're, how are you here? What are you right. doing here? And then me, right? Like, and this is big. That's why mindset is so significant in culture. Because now uh, I'm, I'm talking to a woman. I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm from the hood. Like, I was keeping it real. And I remember there was this OG, like a gentleman that, you know, growing up how I grew up, if I did it, if I succeeded in, in, in hood life, then I would want to be like this, this gentleman, this yeah. OG, right? And he's the one that's talking to me. And he was like, I, I just got to say, you know, I was keeping it real. And he was like, keeping it real. So like, you were keeping it real stupid. Yeah, exactly. And then he goes back to watching the game, right? And that struck me because now like I didn't listen to, you know, all those other people that were sowing seeds. This is who I was this is who I was uh emulating. This is who I wanted yeah. to be when I and now I'm having a conversation face to face. And then later we went to go on and have a conversation and he shared how like, yeah, he made the choices he made and he did what he had to do, what he felt he had to do, but that's because he had limited options. And he actually took the chances and made the choices he made so that his kids wouldn't have to do what he was doing. And that really struck me. And I realized like that was another aha moment. And it was like, okay, you know what? This ain't the place for me. I need to get out, go back to college, graduate, go on with my life and be great. But here's the twist. When I told any and everybody else while I was in prison, like, yeah, man, right. So I'm living my faith now. I got a big vision. I didn't know that you can't. <clears throat> I didn't know that you can't always share your dream with anybody. Like you have to be wise who you share your dreams with. They're fragile and they're valuable. You just don't give those to anybody. And I would be telling the other homies, other felons that are locked up with me, like, yeah, man, I'm going to get out. I'm going to go to college. They would laugh in my face. They would literally like, they would laugh and then they would go grab other people and bring them back and be like, "Hey, hey, hey, tell him what you told me because they thought it was so foolish that I thought I would get out of prison and succeed. That I would, that, that they thought it was crazy that I thought I would get out of prison and go to college and be successful. But nonetheless, the way it worked out is I was right. And I did. I got out of prison. I got readmitted to the prestigious University of Texas at Austin. I ultimately graduated with a 4.0. Nice. I was, in prison, I was in prison with four felonies. Now I'm graduating from UT with a 4.0. And that's when I realized that I had made a change in my life. And I went from Saul to Paul, which is from the Bible, the Apostle Paul. Before mm. he was Saul, he had this life transformation. He went from Saul to Paul. I had this transformation. And then that's what I dedicated my life to be the chain. Saul, Paul. There it is. The legend. So when you, it seems like when you got out of prison, second time, it was straight up there for you. You were... That was it. Like you had bought in that you could use your smarts and all your talents to make smart decisions, right? That's it. So Uh, did you have any setbacks when you stepped out of the, I mean, out of prison? I mean, setbacks all the time. I was talking to a, uh, a mentee of mine this morning. mm -hmm. He called me at eight, uh, maybe by like eight 45. And uh, I guess today he was starting a new job. Well, I know today he was starting a new job and he was quite excited uh, about the job, but he called me distraught because when he showed up on this Monday morning to start his new job, they told him that the offer to work at the company 
was rescinded. They took it back because of his criminal background. Uh, I actually had that happen to me. No criminal background. But I had that situation happen where we were a go. I just needed to come back and sign the paperwork. And they emailed me and said, we've reconsidered. And I was like, damn, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah, that sucks, right? The punch in the gut, and does you know? So, wow, that's a a curiosity question. When you got out, did UT accept you right back? No issues? Did they look at your record and have questions? Did you have to jump through extra hoops? Like, what was the great question? Uh, That's a great question. People often ask me, right? Because I've written a book, uh, you know, I've given a thousand keynotes telling this story, mm-hmm. telling my story. Uh, and I, I wrote a book about it. Um, they made a film about it. Um, I'm excited. A new one comes out next year called Be the Chain. Uh, but then there's always this part because I tell the story like, yeah, I went from four felonies to a 4.0. I was in prison. I got out. I was like, I'm focused. I'm going to go back to college. I'm going to graduate. And I did. And then people always be like, wait, 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 wait. Okay, that's great. That's great. Wait, but how did you go from prison to UT? Like, and then they ask the question you just asked, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, okay, oh, oh my bad. I skipped I skipped the key part. So let me tell you how I went from uh being incarcerated in the Texas State Penitentiary to graduating to getting back into college at the University of Texas at Austin. So uh, this is for for this is for anybody listening only. Like this is not for the world to know. This is like inside information. This is exclusive. Mm. All right, cool. This is how I got back in while I was in prison. Um, I got back in because I I applied, and that's the punchline. I know it's anticlimactic. It's like and there like, it oh, is. How like from prison. How did you go from prison like back to UT? And the real takeaway here is many times the limits are in our mind. Yes, that's a very like, good point. I was, enough, I was foolish enough to believe like I was in prison, and it just clicked for me one day. Like, okay, so my OG called me stupid. Like I was keeping it real stupid. Uh, prison sucks. They act like it's fun on TV and in music, but it's not. This is. This is stupid. I don't like it here. I don't want to be here. I'm never coming back. They also used to laugh at me about that when I was like, I'm never coming back. And then they were like, yo, so you can't say what's going to happen. I remember that so clearly. They were like, you can't say what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to come back or not. And that was the most absurd thing I had ever heard at this point in my life. I was listening to these people talk and talk so uh, talk with such uh, lack of power over their own life. Like They're literally like, I cannot dictate what's going to happen. And that just didn't make sense to me. Like, it's your life. Why wouldn't you dictate it? But anyway, I'm in prison and I'm like, okay, I'm going to get out of prison and I'm going to go back to college and graduate. And I started filling out applications uh, while I was in prison. Like, I was accepted to a a few universities while I was still incarcerated. I had even been given a parole date yet. But nonetheless, and, and the real takeaway that I want people to get here is like, what do you believe? It doesn't matter what you can do or what they tell you you can't do. It's like, what do you believe? Because once you start to believe, then you start to see. Once you start to believe, then you see the pathway to do. Once you start to believe, then you have the the heart, the tenacity, the courage, the resilience, the perseverance to actually make it happen because you believe and you see the goal. Now, things happen all the time. Uh, But the simple answer to that question, Like, how did I go from being uh, incarcerated in prison to getting accepted into college? And the answer is, I applied. Well, two things on that. One, there is a lot of people, well, I don't know about a lot, but there's a percentage of people in prison that are going to college while in prison, correct? Correct. They're taking classes, right? I know people that are coming out with bachelor degrees, like masters, while they're in prison. Right. They're they're putting that energy into constructive use. And this quote popped in my head, which is amazing. I can never remember quotes, but it's by, I think it's Henry Ford that said, whether you can or you can't, you're right. So exactly, I agree with that. Whether you whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're, you're right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You're right. Oh, the question is because I know how people think. So I'm like, 
I went from prison, uh, incarceration to college graduation. And the way I got back into the college is I applied. And so somebody, because they have mind monsters and mind monsters are those negative pessimistic thoughts that pop up in your head. As soon as you hear something, it's like the mind monster just shows up and says, no, they'll say, yeah, well, you can apply, but they can still tell you no. Just like my mentee, my friend uh, told me today, my little bro. And he was like, you know, he applied to a job and they said yes. And then he showed up. And then they were like, oh, never mind. We renege on our offer. You can no longer have this job. And that's just called life. You said yeah. it happened to you. And you're not even a felon, mm-hmm. right? You see, like, it was an ex-felon or a returning citizen or whatever language you want to call. Because now there's big language about like, and I get the value of the words and whatnot. But, um, right. But somebody who has that stigma or that baggage of, I have a criminal background. And because of that, I can't do this or do that, they'll be like, the reason why I got, re- like, the reason why I can't succeed is because of this. And it's like, there are other people that have the same obstacles uh, and they don't even have the same baggage. So exactly. Baggage and more about, like, your goal and how, and your tenacity, your uh, commitment to accomplishing the task. Had I not got back into the University of Texas, I would have, I won't even mention other colleges that I was accepted to. But again, I was accepted into a few different colleges. I had a, uh, I had a plan, not a backup plan. I had a plan. And the crazy part is even when I got out, before I got back into UT, uh, I had to go to, uh, because of the timing of it all and, and finances, because I went to college initially on a academic scholarship. And this time I had to pay my way. Mm. Makes so it more went, valuable, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and, oh my goodness. Yeah, I used to skip classes. I could do a whole, uh, you know, uh, Kleptum. before, after, right? Like when I went to college on academic scholarship, I used to be like, ooh, I skipped class and nobody even cared. Uh, yeah, it's like, well, it's paid for. You're just not you're wasting your money. Now the second time it's like, hey, I'm going to class. I'm going to TA hours. I'm checking out equipment. I'm t- like, I paid for this. Like, all right, this isn't free. This isn't a benefit. This is like, what I paid for it. I'm going to make the most of it. One of the first things I taught college for a couple of years. And one of the first things I would tell my students uh, at the beginning of class was, because I had a lot of freshmen. I, well, I taught freshmen all the way to seniors. But when I had my freshman class, I would say, you know, my job is no longer to shape your mind. My job is now to give you the information, work with you through it so you understand it. And then based on the output that you give me, calculate a grade. So whatever you see is what you did. It has nothing to do with me. And they just look at me and and it didn't really click to some people until their grades were starting to suffer. And, you know, we'd have that discussion. This is not on me. If you don't understand what I'm, you know, putting out, I have office hours I answer my emails. I will get with you one-on-one, whatever it took to help you understand it. But that's your responsibility, right? That was some aha moments for a lot of students too. So let me ask this. I'm going to move it forward here just in the uh, interest of time here. Um, You So you graduated and now you have this degree. You have overcome some serious obstacles. And you and I had this discussion when we were at the gala, because I was making a comment about veteran treatment court. And you said you were familiar with it, where they veteran treatment court, we did a whole series on it um, in this podcast and service members, veterans that make bad decisions that are less than felony misdemeanors and whatnot are given a second chance. And what impressed me about you, and this is what I said to you, I don't know if you heard it because the music was super loud, but I said, they're given a second chance and you had to give yourself a second chance. And so that's what impressed me more than anything, because I think actually that second part of the statement is true for everybody. You can be given the second chance, right? But you have to give yourself also 
the second chance. You have to give yourself permission to succeed, which is what I hear from you and your mission and what you're doing now, right? On be the change. Well so, stated. Well stated. Yes, you have to give yourself the second chance. Uh, I've given myself a second chance, third chance, fourth mm-hmm. out now. Uh, I just call it self love. Mm-hmm. I, I call it self love. I recognize it's actually part of self care, and because I don't want to be a hypocrite or fraudulent. I also give that same grace to people I interact and engage with. Yes. And I think more people did that, we'd have a better planet. Yes. Um, because we'd have a better culture <clears throat> and uh, be, be, it would be better communities because there would be better people. But that's the deal. You have to give yourself that second chance like, um, and give yourself time. So yeah, that, that's definitely what it was about. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. So, okay. So you have, you're giving yourself grace. You're understanding things now. Your mom's um, sage advice and certain people along the way, the seeds are growing. They've been watered and they're blooming now. Yes, they are. They are. And so where are you at now? Because you have a lot of things going on. I said, trying to nail you down, you know, there, you're like, oh, I'm getting ready to launch my record. I'm like, oh, that's so exciting. So. I've done a couple launches. I'm like, yeah, I know what that's like. It's chaos. So I'm just going to leave you alone until you popped up again. And you did. You're like, hey, Donna, I'm back. I'm like, okay. Um, So tell everybody what you're doing now, because this is really, you know, when I introduced you, I said Grammy a couple times in there, Grammy nominee. So what are you doing now? I love it. So let me see how to do this. Let's see if I can do this succinctly. So uh, I'm Saul Paul. I'm an artist an entrepreneur. So Paul, as an artist, I entertain, inspire, and empower. Uh, As a keynote, I share my story, how I transitioned from prison incarceration to college graduation. As a success coach, I focus on the science of success uh, and help others live their best lives by becoming high-performing individuals. As an entrepreneur, I have a company called Saul Paul Productions, and we put on live events, whether that's concerts, festivals, uh, or conferences. Uh, Because my brand has grown and I've become, um, uh, because my brand has grown and Saul Paul has become like somewhat like a a household name, uh, I want to take advantage of that and leverage it. Uh, So I started a campaign called Be The Change. And Be The Change is a social good campaign It empowers other people to live their best lives and be the change. To be the change, we've empowered um, millions of people across the world, various continents, numerous countries, uh, as well as numerous states across the U.S. Last fall, we had this Be the Change Challenge. The Be the Change Challenge is when individuals uh, accept the challenge to be the change in their own community by coming up with a volunteerism project and giving back. they don't, We don't dictate what that looks like. They get to dictate what that looks like because they live there. It's their voice, so it should be their choice. We focus specifically, I did, I went on a 100 city uh, tour in 32 states. I visited 100 K through 12 schools. Wow. 125,000 students. And of those 125,000 students, uh, 20,000 plus joined our Be The Change Challenge. They came up with their own volunteerism campaigns, whether that was a clothing drive, a sock drive, uh, whether they wrote letters to senior citizens. Maybe they were seniors in high school. They tutored other students that were in uh, elementary. Some cool kids in Ohio, uh, they were smart. I say they're smart because they took what they cared about, uh, which was gaming, and then they mixed it with giving back. So uh, ultimately, they drank energy drinks all night, had a 24-hour live video game uh, streamathon, and then they raised money. They took the money that they raised while they streamed live on Twitch, playing video games, and then they donated it to a local children's hospital. Oh wow! So, that came up with that. yeah, right. That's so cool. Okay, wait. People we gotta can... talk because my kids go to Randolph. It's a you know it's a school on base here. 
So we're going to talk. You're just up the road from us. Come on. We need to get them involved with the Be the Change Challenge. We focused nationally uh, last year. This year, our focus is in Texas. And so, yeah. Okay, right let's, now. we'll talk afterwards. But that, I'm going to put that in planting the seed, right? I want to bring you down. There it is. Okay, wait, so tell yeah, me. Uh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Well, as I say, tell us um, your water, because that's another thing that you. Yeah, that, that's next. That's like, uh, that's the cool part. People are like, how do I join the Be the Change Challenge? Well, we have uh, this alkaline water company we started called Change Water. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about the water. It's alkaline water. It's boosted with electrolytes. What makes it special? Uh, it has oxygen added to it. It's locally sourced uh, in Central Texas at the Carisco Wilcox uh, Aquifer. But it's not about the water. The water is excellent. The mission is even better. We donate 50% of the profits from the sale of the water to local schools and nonprofits. That's how we were able to fund our 100 city, um, our 100 city tour visiting all these schools because there was no charge to the school. Uh, and that's what allowed us to impact so many people. Oh, we wow. Have dist- yeah, we have distribution through one of the top distributors in the country, KE. It's available at various stores across the country. Uh, if people were in San Antonio, uh, they could get it at Amy's Ice Cream, other local independent retailers. Uh, I know that there's a big grocery store that's headquartered It's not there. an H-E-B yet? We got to work on that, H-E-B, if you're listening. Why do you not have his water? Yeah. That part, that part. Uh, yeah, so we have Be The Change. We have Change Water, uh, which is the retail arm of the Be The Change movement. Very awesome. All right. So music got nominated for a Grammy, correct? I did. My most recent was as a producer for a project called Black Men Are Precious. Before that, it was as uh, for a project called All One Tribe. It's really, really cool. Myself, I am part rapper, part singer-songwriter. Uh, I tell my story through music. Uh, I don't know. I just make good vibes, make good music, and do it high quality. Um, and it's been cool to have been uh, recognized via the Recording Academy. Uh, these projects that I've created, it's so cool. People go follow me on social, like at Saul Paul on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, wherever, LinkedIn, whatever. You could uh, see like what it was like when I was at the Grammys, when I was on the red carpet, when I did my fancy. thing. Fancy. Yeah, fancy, fancy. I was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I learned something because I listened to one of your TED Talks. And so you want to tell everybody, I did not I did not know this, that I was today old when I learned what rap <laughs> stood for. What does it stand for? Oh, I, uh, I was too busy laughing. I didn't hear it. You oh, said you were two days uh, old when you learned. What that rap actually was an acronym oh, for. Rhythm and poetry. Rhythm and poetry. I was like, damn, the things you learn. Rhythm is the beat and the poetry is the word. So having said that, I, I'm baiting you along here. So Saul Paul has this really neat thing that he does that, and he did it at uh, the gala that we were at. And he said, throw out five words and I'll do a rap. Can can I put you on the spot? <laughs> I'm in my studio. Let me see. Uh, this will be a good conclusion. Yes, That's yes. what I wanted to do. And, and we actually, at the gala, we threw in supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and I'll be damned. He did a rap to that. Uh, it was awesome. But I won't do that one to him. All right. So then what will... Uh... What are the words we're gonna include? Okay, I I wrote down five when we were talking. Wow, you came prepared. You already wrote them in uh, advance. I was already planning this. <laughs> All right. All right. So the five words I have are change. Okay. Resilient. All right. Love. Past. You got it. Wait. Whoop. Change. Resilient. Love. What was the last one? Past and future. Past and future. I was being easy right. on you. All right. Now you got to throw one in for like just being creative, like oddball word. Oddball word. How about, um, mm, how about panther? 
<laughs> okay. That's the one tattoo that I have. <laughs> yeah, there's a famous tattoo parlor in Houston called Dago's. And uh, when my grandmother was alive, she wouldn't allow me to get a tattoo. And so, uh, yeah, when she passed away, that limitation was gone. And I went to Dago's and got a uh, tattoo on my chest with a panther, black panther. Nice. My intuition was, uh, was kicking in there. Wakanda forever. All right, let me see. Freestyle. He didn't know I was doing this. So I'm telling you, this was completely spontaneous. I did not give him a heads up. I know. Okay, now let me see. Uh, so improvisational freestyle, the words that we have on deck. Let me see if I can remember. We have change, resilience, past, future. Love. Love and panther. Yep. All right. All right. It's gonna be fun. Uh, let me see. I dedicate this to everyone listening. Okay, wait, let me see. You're right, you're right in the studio. There you go. All right. Got it. Um, so this song will be made of totally improvisational. On the spot. Uh, I think this is what life is like. Sometimes in life, life comes at you fast. You don't really get to dictate what you get, but you still got to make the most of it. And not just make the most of it, but make it exceptional. It's your life. So I don't get to pick these words. I just got to take what I've been given. And so here's what I got. See, uh, Hmm. Pregunta, but what's the answer? They go, H town. I got that panther. If you don't speak Spanish, pregunta means question. If you stay focused, there's no need for stress. Lessons I've learned as I continually love. Started from the bottom, but I rose up above. Yeah. Due to took my past. I recognize right now the present is like, yeah. This is all that I get. Freestyle off top, yeah. I'm gonna represent. Mm. Yeah, plus I am resilient. Doing what I do, long flow like rumble still skin. I still win. Long as the earth spin, I take it out. Say like Randy Durkin, or like them pastors preaching in them churches. I'm gonna do what I do. It's all service, and if it's not, it's probably just worthless. But I'm platinum. I'm gold. My worth is even more valuable than all that. I think I use every word, but what you call that? Uh, if I didn't, tell me what did I forget? Because I just made it on the spot. Freestyles I spit. I didn't have time, so it wasn't red. I didn't hear nothing, so I guess I did hear. That is awesome. <laughs> Was that every word? I think we got them all, right? I think you got them all. Yes. Did you get future in there? Panther, yep. You did. did. Yep. Pa future, past, love, resilient, change, and panther. Ah. Yeah, I got them all. Nice job. I'm telling you, I fell over. They were throwing out craziness to you, super califragilist. I'm like, oh my lord. And you nailed it. You got all of it in there. I think they even put like platypus in there or something like that. Platypus, yes. <laughs> that was crazy. So all right. So Paul, you are nothing less than impressive. You and I clicked from the moment we met. Um I I totally, it totally picked up on your energy. Um, and I'm hoping that we will keep in touch. I, I am serious about bringing you down to our schools. That's uh, for sure. I would love it. We definitely need to make that happen. Uh, I'm really, really excited right now. We're, um, what are we doing? We focus on the schools. We already have numerous schools signed up. We have nonprofits signed up. Uh, oh, actually, I guess I should mention this. The week after Thanksgiving, November, the week of November 25th, we will be hosting, actually the week of the 27th, uh, we'll be hosting Be The Change Week. So there will be ample, there will be ample opportunities for individuals to join us uh, during Be The Change Week, no matter where they are in the country, no matter where they are in the state of Texas, no matter where they are in San Antonio. 
Uh, they can join us, uh, sign up for the Be The Change Challenge. If they just go to SawPaul.com, they can join us. And our goal is to inspire 1,000 plus acts of change making in kindness. That is awesome. And, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. Not at all. It really doesn't. I I will share this last thought. Um, I didn't say it when we were talking, but it was popping in my head. So I thought I would share it is when you were talking about people like your mom and other people that were around that were planting those seeds. I put this out to the audience. You have no idea what your impact is for good or not. uh, When you interact with people. Um, And I found this out uh, a couple of years ago, a very, my best friend sends me a picture and it's a suicide note. Mm. And she said, I was, she was in the middle of moving and she was cleaning out my stuff. And I found this and I want to tell you that you stopped it. Like that was a rough time. And it was talking to you that kept me going through it. I had no idea, no idea she was that close. I knew she was struggling. I knew that she was going through some very difficult times, but I did not know she was that close. So you never know. You don't. And, you know, when we say things like be the change and, you know, Saul Paul, you walk in and you got your drip that says be the change on it. And, and you know, you're up on stage and you're singing and, you know, and, and you're doing all this stuff. And people go, oh, my God, like, I can't do that. Like, nobody asks you to step in and do 45 different things if that's not your thing. Um, if your thing is to walk by somebody and say, hey. I really like your shoes or, Hey, you got a great smile. Then do it. That's all you got to do. You do not have to compare yourself to anybody and what they're doing. It, it, there's no comparison. Some people are just wired differently. I, I'm wired like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like doing a lot of different things, but that's just what keeps me engaged. So yeah. it's not everybody. And if you're doing your small part, then you are part of being the change, right? That's it. All right. What do you got? Any last words before we wrap it up? No, you ended it beautifully. All, right. All I will add is that uh, I would like to encourage everyone to recognize that you were born on purpose with a purpose. Excellent. All right, everybody. This is uh, Beyond the Front Line. And like always, we love it when you guys engage, when you share, when you comment. We really want to hear from you. We want to hear what you want to hear about, what you want to learn about. We'll we'll talk to anybody. We ain't shy. Um, and we want to bring you the resources that will help you. Um, just because we're veterans doesn't mean that we have to have the veteran bringing us the resource. There are so many people around like Saul Paul that are doing these amazing things, and you can be part of that in your own way. So from all of us here at Beyond the Front Line and our parent podcast and parent network coming home well, uh, we thank all of you and you have an awesome week. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Front Line, a podcast of coming home well. Join us every other Wednesday. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well.